there we are. I think I'm finally live. Woohoo! So I'm just going to wait and see if people want to come and join me. As we're going to have a little bit of a chat all about shot collars. Um, hello to the couple people that jumped on now. It's lovely to see you. I'm going to write a hello. Thank you for joining me. Ah, good evening, Jean. Lovely to see you. Oh, I'm done. Oh, there's more people joining than I thought. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes to let people kind of join and make sure that everyone has got their brew because that's what you need when people go live. Especially when you talk about things that aren't so very nice like shock collars. And the reason I'm doing this is I've been seeing a few different things all over my Facebook feed, as I'm sure everyone else in the dog industry has done, where there's certain people that aren't necessarily qualified to start giving advice about it and they're promoting it and it's it's just it's not okay. So I kinda wanted to voice my concerns so my clients know where I stand and so anyone else that's looking into things or would like like a reference to share with other people. Uh, the video is going to be recorded. I'll show you on my YouTube channel so you can use it as a later date. Because the main thing that I want to get across to people is we focus so much on the dogs, which is a good thing. Like I'm not against like not listening to our dogs, of course. But there's far more to consider when it comes to shock collars than just the effect of the dogs. We have not only the well-being of the dog and their ability to learn in that situation, but also the clients and their welfare. And the potential impact they can have on the trainers that are forced to use these devices or willingly use these devices not to mention livestock so that's what i'm going to talk about today if you have any questions by all means jump on um, ask any questions comment away i will happily answer any questions that anyone might have so the first thing that i want to mention is that i'm not going to argue about whether shot collars work or not because unfortunately they do they work for the reasons that I don't agree with. Ethically, I cannot use them. But for me, they work just as well as they did on the study in children where they had shocks, shock collars essentially on their wrists as bracelets. And they found out that if you shock children, misbehaving children in the classroom, they'd stop misbehaving. And they're like, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a decent study. That has evidence. We know that if you anticipate that pain that these children will somehow magically behave themselves. My question then is, but are they able to learn? Did their scores improve when they stopped misbehaving because they had these bracelets on? What effect did it have on them? Were we looking at any cortisol levels that they might have been doing or ask them any questions about the stress levels? How long were they wearing the bracelets for? Once they stopped the behavior, were they still continually wearing them? That's the bit that always worries me with shock collars is we also know from from lots of studies based on children, especially really, really old psychology based studies, as it's not necessarily the physical side of things that affects them. Hello, Jesse. <laughs> um, I'm sure Jesse can, can agree with me when we come to, um, to the psychology side of things, is that it's not the physical thing that's the punishment. That's not as, as bad of it when it comes to the shocks. It's the anticipation of, so we know for children that were smacked and all those kinds of studies is it wasn't the actual smacking themselves. It wasn't the physical violence that was, it was harmful, but it wasn't as harmful as the threat of the physical violence. So that little beep that you can push before the shock collar goes off. They're the bits that tend to do the most damage for our animals because animals can't predict or control, you know, in order to reduce anxiety. All of my clients will know that I'm saying this is to help reduce the anxiety and build confidence in our animals. They need to predict the environment. They need to have an element of control over their environment. Like they need that. Choice and control is so important for all mammals, including us, our children, our animals. They need elements throughout the dark life that they are free and safe to choose and make choices without fear of punishment, without fear of violence, without fear in general. And if they're wearing one of these devices, they're not free of that. So they're always going to be in that, in that state of worry. And if you do this in younger dogs in particular, it's going to affect their brain because their brain is going to build up in a more traumatic way. It's 
going to have that effect on their neurological circuits. So their fight and flight is going to get activated faster. Their innate alarm system is going to be going overboard. The part of the brain that kind of helps them develop to learn creativity and to build a confidence and security and curiosity, all those kind of wonderful care systems or seeking systems, they're not going to form properly because the animal's scared and they're shut down. And one of the most heartbreaking things for me to deal with in my job as a behaviorist is when I see these really shut down dogs. Not necessarily ones from, from using shock collars, though they are there too, but ones where they have been suppressed and they are just shut down and they are just shells of themselves. And you ask them to do something and they'll do it, they will comply. But they're going through the motions, they're not really there. They're as close to dissociating that I ever see in an animal where they're just, they're not consciously with us. They're just kind of doing what we want, but they're just not, they're not there. You don't see the relaxation, the muscles, you don't see the happiness on their faces. We don't see the relaxation with them. And they're the parts that are always really worrying with our dogs. We also know that it's not always the pain that is the problem with punishment, it's the startle effect. It's the startle that inhibits the behavior, not necessarily the pain itself. So I'm not here to argue about whether shock collars cause pain because for some dogs they do, for some dogs they don't. Um, it depends on the personality of the dog, it depends on the resilience of the dog. I've known dogs that have gone through bramble, through electric fences in order to flush out pheasants, chase deer. Those dogs, yeah, they're not going to stop for a shock. They're too high in adrenaline, they're, they're built to push through it. Whereas I know other dogs that have been on a walk, they've been accidentally shocked by an electric fence and they have not gone anywhere near that walk ever again. If they so much as feel the vibrations on the floor where the fences are, then they can't cope and they won't go anywhere near any situations where it has that. So the bits that are always worrying for our dogs. But I want us to have a think about this and to have a look at it, not so much from our dog's perspective, because I think most of us here will agree, especially most of my clients and colleagues, that it's not ethical to train dogs from the dog welfare perspective especially when there are other things out there. And the biggest argument I hear is the predator chase one. And, you know, it's called a lead. <laughs> um, I have an Alaska Malamute cross husky, um, incredibly strong dog, very high prey drive. He's 15 now. And we have never had an incident where he's gone off chasing livestock. We've never had an instance where he's been threatened to be shot by the farmer because he's chasing livestock. Because we avoid livestock. Like if he's in a field, and there's livestock around and we have to get through that field he's on a short leash and that's for two reasons one because i need to keep him under control and make sure that he's not in a long line that i could drop or he could dislocate my shoulder if he runs full pelt but it's for the sheep or the livestock there are studies that show that these animals are better they feel safer if they're around strange dogs if they're on a short lead and i'm getting a bit annoyed with the situations where everyone's about dog welfare, which is fantastic, but there's the welfare of others to consider. And the livestock will come back to you later because the biggest bit of welfare that I'd like us to have a think about tonight is the human welfare. It's one thing for us to say to a client, this is gonna save your dog's life. All you need to do is ramp this collar up onto full, shock it, and we can stop the project chase. Or it's okay, we can work on this dog and we can gradually build it up. This is one that always confuses me because we're gradually building up this shock so it's not going to hurt it but then we keep ramping it up to the point where it does hurt it so we're essentially desensitizing the animal to the feel of the collar itself so we have to get it to a point where where we shock it you know any of us know any if you have a tattoo for example you will know the first time that they stick that needle in you know you'll be like oh okay i feel that after a while you don't feel it anymore your body's just desensitized to it same thing can happen with these collars, which is why they're a bit unsure about how they work. But my question is, how much choice do the owners get in these situations? You know, it is extremely traumatic for pet owners to be put in a situation where they have to witness their dog being abused. And I've had clients that have come to me after being with different dog trainers where they've literally been in tears and they feel so guilty and horrified that they stood by and they watched someone else shock their dog or they watched someone else do something else to their dog and everyone's like well they were there they consented i'm like no that's not it's not consent um 
we have to be able to give people a choice in these matters. And whenever we are with clients, for myself and any other trainer out there, when we are with a client, we are the voice of authority in that situation, which means that people are more likely to listen to us, especially if they're in a place where they're feeling vulnerable because they don't know what else to do. Some of them are feeling desperate. They're looking for a quick fix. They're looking for a last resort. They're not sure what happens and they put their trust in us. Now, anyone that is familiar with psychology, especially early psychology, there's a lot of very unethical studies that were done quite early on. We're going to get interrupted by a Spocky. Hello. Um, there were lots of studies done early on where people were basically told to shock someone because a person in a white coat with a clipboard asked them to. And despite their better knowledge, they did what they were told because the voice of authority told them to. And we've seen this time and time again in different variations of these studies. Many of them would not pass an ethics committee nowadays. Milgram studies, standard prison experiments, these kinds of ones where you put people in a situation where they feel coerced to do something. They feel like they, they have to do it, so they'll go ahead with it. And I think one person in that study would shock an unsuspecting person in front of them to the point where that person could die just because they were told to by a voice of authority. So we have to be really careful when we're with our clients if you're doing that sort of thing, that this is where they are. And for me, it's I don't understand how you could put a client in that situation and continue doing that and think it's okay. So we've got to really have a look at this from multiple angles. You know, who are the people that are doing these and are they aware of the situation they're in? Because I'm pretty sure that very few trainers that use these devices will be aware of the damage they could potentially be causing to the person, not just the dog, for what they've got going on here, for the situations they're putting these people in. Does that make sense? Just interesting. So we have a question. Um, when Skylar was younger, very young puppy, and sat at the roadside, the guy next to her with his dog shocked his dog. Did I imagine that then affected Skylar? Because I did feel it. Put others thought I overacted. Dogs are really sensitive. There's a very good chance that Skylar at least knew that something happened. Like dogs are social animals, they have different ways. They would have been able to smell the reaction in that dog as a baseline, if nothing else. They'll be able to kind of think about that and be like, oh, something bad happened to the dog next door. And they'll have that kind of pack mentality. So a lot of these dogs, they're, they're shocked to kind of stop them from, from doing things that we don't want them to do or because people perceive them as dominant and it's, it's, it's not right. And I worry that some people that are learning about how effective shock collars are um, or how useful prong collars are is they don't quite understand the damage they could potentially be doing, not only to the animals, but to the people they're asking to use them. And could you imagine what it would be like to be one of these people that you have been in a situation where you've felt forced to either watch someone else shock your dog and hear the dog yelp, or you've been forced to do it yourself. You have convinced yourself that it's okay, so your cognitive dissonance is really, really high. And you're trying to come to terms with the fact that it's not. Or you have just done it so much that the device just seems normal. And this is the part that really concerns me. Like we have trainers that are using these devices and they're not just one-offs. People are paying these people to shock their dogs multiple times a day, every day. Like all of us that train dogs, you know, we, if we click and reward our dogs. We're treating our dogs. We're seeing, you know, multiple clients every day for weeks. And I, to be honest, I'm a bit concerned about the health and the welfare of the people that use these devices, about how desensitized they are naturally becoming to these situations. Because what is something that I could never do to my dog? Like I would never be able to put a shock collar on my dogs and shock them. There are times where I have, I have kind of threatened it when they've been being essentially knobs. Um, and I've gone, ah, you know, but I would never actually do it. Because if I wanted to do it, that's a frustration burst in me. That's because I know that I haven't set my dog up properly or I've lapsed in my training somewhere. Like the dog isn't doing any of these behaviors to be bad, to be naughty or anything else. They're doing them because they're dogs. 
and dogs chase dogs run off dogs are social they go and do their other things so for me to put a shock collar on my dog and shock them that would have a really upsetting effect on me to be honest i wouldn't be able to do it so i don't understand the mentality of people that can and i worry for those that are able to do it repeatedly every day for years and like that level of desensitization to the potential suffering around them and the position of authority they're in it's a different mindset and i would love love to see a cross-examination study hello diana i would love to see someone cross-examine a study between like personality traits for example of pet of trainers who use these devices on a regular basis and those who don't and see if there's any traits that particularly come up see if there's something there that makes them more inclined to distance themselves from these situations that, that makes them more able to do these things because it's really worrying for me um replying to Oh, I like the clarification. And um, the yes, absolutely was in response to me. Hello, Lisa. Oh, have we hit the time zone where my American buddies are jumping on now? Um, so for those that have just jumped on, um, I will reiterate just slightly some of the stuff that I was mentioning. Because what I've been talking about is essentially looking at the shot collar debate from a slightly different perspective on the welfare of the caregiver of the dog's owners, the people that are actually looking after the dog. They're the people that I'm, that I'm also concerned about because they are put in a position where they feel like they have to do it. And many of them don't. And the heartbreak I see from a lot of these pet owners when they've come to me and they're like, this person put the shot collar on my dog, my dog yelps and now they feel so guilty. But they let it happen. And they feel like they had a choice there and they didn't. They were put in a position of authority and as a person in authority we have to be aware that we are dealing with essentially vulnerable people they're in crisis they're in often very desperate times they need a fix because they've been threatened or they're worried about their dog's life or they've read too much stuff um and the other thing that i'd like us to have a little bit of discussion about is the welfare of the animals because in order to use these shock collars quite often they're shocking the dogs a lot around livestock so the poor unsuspected livestock in the field are having these dogs run towards them and they're being shocked or they're being worked with alongside and being shocked. And you don't really hear of that side of things very often. It'd be nice to see some more people that are knowledgeable in livestock welfare talk about it from the other perspective. You know, it's and I know a tutor of mine was like, it's not fair to to kind of be promoting the welfare of one species whilst denying the welfare of another species. You know, it should be continuous across the board. And that includes the humans. That includes the caregivers. You know, so when we've got caregivers that are, they don't understand what it is that they're doing wrong. And I see this more with prong collar users than shock collar users, because prongs seem to be the little bit of a way down that make people feel a little bit more in control because they have to for a safety reason. Or they have to for an accessibility reason because their dog's an assistance dog and they need to make sure that they've got control of it. And I'm speaking as a disabled person, you don't need a prong collar for your assistance dogs. I have two. They don't have prong collars. They have a, a harness and they have a front attachment on it. And that gives me all the control I need. Um, and that is the same for, for my boy, Deefer, who is my 15-year-old Alaska Malamute. Like he has never been on a prong collar. He's never been on a shock collar. Um, he has a collar, he has a harness, he's on a front control harness. And that's how he walks. He walks lovely and, and nice. And if he reacts, I've got full control over him. There were times when in his early days where we used to occasionally put a head collar on at the same time for extra control in the mud and in the ice. So I made sure I wasn't able to fall over. So if we're using these devices for heel work, if we're using them for obedience exercises, if we're using them for recalls there's just there's no need they don't they don't do anything useful for our animals and once we start using them as i mentioned earlier on is it puts those animals in that state of fear and animals can't learn in a state of fear if they're constantly anticipating something bad their innate alarm system is just there like they're ready to go they're they just can't think 
all they do is just react to the situations. And yes, you'll have some fantastic obedience from these animals because they are too scared not to. They will do exactly what you ask when they ask. A lot of them don't always understand what it is that you want them to do. They just give you a behavior that they know hasn't been punished that much in the past and hope it's the right one. Often it's a sit. And we end up building up some of these breeds. Unfortunately, Spaniels in particular seem to be one of those breeds that almost have that, that sort of battered wife syndrome that people talk about when you get stuck in that abuse cycle, in that domestic abuse cycle, where you've got that trauma bond coming in, where you know they have something really, really bad, but they give you something really good afterwards and you get them addicted to you. That happens in a lot of our dogs in these situations. And I've seen a lot of trainers where they use these devices and the dogs are wiggly and they're wagging the tail and they're coming up to them and go, look, they're really happy, they're fine. I'm like, no, <laughs> these are really appeasing dogs. These are dogs that are just, they are so scared and they are trying to do whatever they can to make you happy. And the worst thing is when I see people trying to teach these dogs to stay and they can't stay because they're trying to make friends with you. They're trying to focus on you and they're wiggling and they're, they're being so very appeasing. And the person's like, no, sit, stay. And they're like, but I need to, I don't shout at me. It's, it's not, it's not nice. Please don't. Um, and it's just, it's not okay to, to see it with these animals. And then you have the other side where it's like, oh, well, I have this particular breed. Insert large breed here um, is the main one. Hey, Vicky. <laughs> As I'm mentioning large breeds, um, Vix is one of the many people that has wolf dogs. Um, had wolf dogs, sorry. Um. And these are, you know, 40, 45 kilogram wolf dogs, you know, Czechoslovakian wolfhound, sow loose type things. They are big dogs. Um, and she's never put a prong collar on her dog. She's never put a shock collar on her dog. Um, they've been able to have canine bridles or head collars and harnesses. There's other things that you can use. You never have to use these devices. So this is more from a welfare perspective where I want us to just have a think about what's actually going on in the minds of these people. And if you've got someone that is more than happy to make a living from shocking an animal daily, um, I'm generally concerned for that individual and I definitely would not be letting them anywhere near my own dogs at all. Um, so have a think about that. And if you talk to people, and you will do, people are out there where they've had to do this, empathize a little bit with the owners because a lot of them are put in the situations where they feel like they have to do this they don't want to and then they are going to be desperate to find a justification for their behavior because the cognitive dissonance will be so that big for them that they won't be able to a lot of them are unable to accept what it is that they've done same thing with some of the trainers it's why you find a lot of these trainers that are on facebook groups and things they get very aggressive very very quickly they get rage very quickly because they panic. They don't want to accept the truth. They don't want to have those feelings again because to comprehend that everything you've done has had this effect on animal, that's a hard thing to work through. And I applaud any trainer that has crossed over, that have used these devices and gone, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I can't do it. And they've, got, and they've managed to move past because it's wonderful when they do that. And that is an incredibly hard thing to do. It's a lot easier to stick your feet in the ground, have a paddy stomp up and say, I'm not changing my ways, I've done this for years. You know, you've opened up to the evidence, you've opened up to the fact that animals have these emotions and they're what we really need to care for. Does anyone have any questions about what I've said so far? I'd love to hear your thoughts. And does anyone disagree with me? Has anyone used shock collars and think that it wasn't a problem? And there are dogs out there. I've seen some dogs get shot by co shot collars and they just shake it off as though it was a wafting. Like they're so used to it and they've got such bold, confident characteristics that they don't feel it. In which case, it's not working at all anyway. <laughs> so it's not worth using it on those dogs. The dogs that it does work on tend to be the ones that are more sensitive, that usually have an underlying anxiety or an underlying fear response. And yes, yeah, sure, you may have stopped the behavior, but you've not sorted out the drive for that behavior. I'll just give it a couple of minutes for the comments to come through because I know they tend to have quite a long delay, don't they, with Facebook comments at the minute. Just 
just looking down to watch my phone because there's a few people that have messaged privately because they don't want to have the message on the live stream which is absolutely fine one person has put they saw a a trainer that was doing some residential trainer training they trusted that they would look after their dog oh and when they came back the dog had but okay so I've had this a couple of times with, with clients where they've had their dog sent to a residential dog trainer and the dog has come back with burn marks around its collar where it's had, it's had a shock done. And that was completely non-consensual for the owner's part or the dog's part. And that has such severe consequences on the mental well-being of these animals. Not to mention it's terrible for the trust of the handler when looking to find a different dog trainer. And sometimes you have to find that you try and justify yourselves to these people say, I'm not going to hurt your dog. Um, to me, it's emotional well-being is the first thing that I consider. We want to make sure the dogs are emotionally feeling safe before we do anything. Um, so yeah, it's horrible when you send your dog off to someone that you think is going to do right by them. And unfortunately, they don't. And often it's lack of knowledge that drives people to use these devices. They don't know another way or they don't understand that there are other driving forces to behavior. And if you don't diagnose what the underlying root cause is, you're not going to fix the behavior. So they just end up kind of trying to stop the behavior rather than working out what's driving it and changing that emotion. Because if you change the emotion, you change the behavior. That's kind of how it works. And uh, someone's asked, I often wonder how trainers like that respond to youngsters in their family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's a link that I'm going to put um, into the comments now because there is an organization called the Lynx Group and they have a look into the, um, the correlation and the relationship between animal abuse and domestic violence. And there's a very, very high link there. And I would like to see some cross studies that look at more into that because you often find that a lot of these people, they have that ability and it tends to be from people, from what I see, it's mostly men, but not always, there are some women and it's people that have an, it's like an innate ability to control, like they're not okay unless they're controlling a situation and they have no idea how to control a situation without force. Like they don't feel like they can do things unless they're feared. And respect comes from fear and it's very much that kind of authoritarian military style relationship um, and that's the main kind of relationship with with dogs there's some wonderful studies that were done in 2020 i think there were um i have them referenced in one of my talks somewhere about parenting styles and the dog owner relationships and we know that authoritarian parenting styles end up with children that have addiction problems, they have mental health problems, they tend to be rebels, they run away. Whereas ones that are authoritative, where they are open, they will put boundaries, but they care for the emotional needs of the children, they end up with your, your most balanced children. And then you've got the absence parents where they're the child's given everything that they need but they don't have the emotional support and that results in similar things to the first one and most of our dog our dog parents um unfortunately are the authoritarian area one which results in poor mental health or animals in a later life so that's a really good point jean is it's how does this relate to other people in the family how does it relate to their to their life and i'd like to see more research on that Mostly so we can help the people that use them and help them understand why they have a need to use these devices on these animals. Because I don't think it's just about they feel it's the right way. I think there's something more to it from a psychological perspective as to why they feel the need to control animals using these devices rather than rewarding them for the behavior. You know, even if you don't want to use food, you can still use smells. You can still use the environment as a reward. You're not limited to just a biscuit if you don't want to be. I recommend you are. It makes it easier, but you don't have to be. Um, someone else has commented, I've never used one. I never intend to. So, yeah, I think many people see them as a quick fix without thinking about the effect on the dog. Absolutely. And one of the worrying things with, with the collars is we know that the animals will form classical associations when they feel a strong emotion and pain and fear are incredibly strong things to feel. 
and we don't know we can never guarantee what the animal is going to put on that association you know if we're trying to prevent a predator chase towards deer for example and as soon as the dog sees the deer or smells the deer who are shocking it that's what we think is happening we don't know from the dog's perspective like what if they put their nose down and we think they've smelt the deer and they smell a rabbit or they're smelling people what if they look up and the first thing they see is a person the association they make that every time they're shocked is when they're with this particular person or in this particular field and there are military dog shock collar studies where when the dogs are trained in particular environments where they know they've been shocked in the past they don't perform as well as when they're trained in other situations or when they're trained with the collars on and with the collars off there's loads of evidence out there um to help support that it's not useful things it's like yes there'll be a quick fix and you will get certain things but the long-term benefits they're just not there we have to look after the emotional needs of these animals if we get that underlying emotion fix if we give them other ways for these outlets that's the much better way to help with our animals we've got to have that teamwork we've got to look after the people's welfare you know the caregivers have to be able to implement whatever strategy we put in place Whatever training method we put in place, we have to make sure that it is safe and it's ethical for other people to use. We're not just talking about whether you can. And one of the biggest arguments I find the shock collars is that they should be used by licensed professionals. Okay. But they're not going to be there. You know, quite often it's not a one trial learning. It's, if you do it really badly and high pain and high startle, then it would be a very strong one trial learning. And you might have it. You, there's a chance that that would work. That's highly unethical for me, <laughs> very highly unethical. And it's certainly not something a person could do. So how do you maintain that behavior? What are you going to give as homework for these clients if these devices should only be used by these professionals? It just, it doesn't work long term. There is no support there. There's no guidance for the humans. Um, not advocating for shock collar. I've seen many shock collar trainers say, that is a bad trainer. Yeah. That would be an awesome conversation to have with me. Is that the human psychology side of things and linking to the, um, the domestic violence? And there are also things that you've got to consider. Um, anyone that has worked in this industry long enough, most of us have been in situations where we have been with clients and there is a very clear, um, uncomfortable power dynamic. Now, I'm not talking about a normal one where it's quite, it's quite playful and that's just how they are and, it, and it's healthy. The ones where one of them is very clearly being spoken over and undermined constantly. And they have to watch their animal be shocked because the other person that they're under that trust bubble with is allowing it. Not to mention the children. You know, if they were in families where there are children present, and the children know that you're using these devices. What's that saying to our children? That it's okay to, to harm these animals? That it's okay to not consider their welfare? Um, so we have to be incredibly careful. This isn't a debate where it's a, is it a bad thing? Do they work? Do they not work? There's such a huge picture to take into account when it comes to shock collars. And that's what I really wanted to come out here to, to say and to get people to think about, just start those conversations you know, is the research out there? If anyone finds research out there, then I would absolutely love it. If anyone is looking for a master's to do, go and do it. Like it, it <laughs> you know, some questionnaires, um, get a whole bunch of participants, see if you can find some links between it. See if we can find some personality traits of trainers that use shock devices and prong collars compared to those of us that are more reward-based trainers and focus more on reward. And, um, Yes, the human psychology power dynamic. Yeah, it's such a big thing. And I think that there will probably, if we looked at it, I would put money on it being a very, very strong <laughs> correlation, if not, not a significant thing, because that there's something in the mindset of people that are capable of doing this that doesn't exist in other people. And you do have the ones in between where they're, they've convinced themselves it's okay and then gone, ah, no, I can't do it. Or they've tried it once, gone, can't do it. Um, others have seen it work and it's just not for me it's not okay and if you're in a situation where you feel that a shock collar is your only option please reach out to a clinical animal behaviorist 
um, or a veterinary behaviourist in the United States, because I don't think you have clinical behaviourists over there. You know, have a have a talk to your force free trainers in the event in the area, your aversive free trainers in the area, because there are ways that you can do that. Um, in England, shot calls are still legal. It's going through a parliament at the minute, so there's bits of where it might not be. Um, in Wales, it is illegal to use them. There's a lot of countries in Europe where it's also illegal, and they have dogs that are absolutely fine, and they don't they're never shocked, and they're okay. We have dogs, I mean, all of our assistant dog organizations, the majority of them are force free. We don't use shock collars, we don't use prong collars. So when I see people from the assistance dog world that I speak to, they're like, oh, I need to have a prong collar on my dog, otherwise I can't control it when I'm in a supermarket or I can't control it in the shopping mall or, or anything like that. You need to have a look about whether your dog is suitable for that working role. And not all of them are, and that's not a, that's not a, anything bad on you it's just some dogs don't have the personality to do it and if you are in a situation where your only way of controlling your dog is through pain and fear we need to reassess that relationship we need to have a look about what it is that's going on between your relationship that you feel that is your only option because i can guarantee it isn't there's always other options <laughs> there's always other things and when you start looking at the animal and focusing on its core emotional needs making sure that it feels safe to begin with, making sure it feels cared for, building up its confidence, getting that bond ready, allowing the animal to experience play, building that curiosity. You're gonna build in other behaviors, you're gonna get them wanting to work with you. And I have successfully taught chase recalls to animals that used to chase deer, that would much rather come back and hang out and play with me. And that's not necessarily because of any particular training technique I've used, it's purely because I have built up that bond with the animal. I've encouraged that owner to create that bond and they have a fantastic relationship. And the animal thrives on the relationship they have with the owner. It doesn't need the outlet of going chasing the deer anymore because it has everything it needs from the owner. They can sit, they can go for a walk. It still goes, ah, there's a deer over there. And go, oh, I want to chase it. And they'll go, can I go chase it? And their, and their caregiver will go, but come over here and we can go and play and do this game that you really enjoy. And the dog's like, oh yeah, I do really love that. And they'll come back. And I don't know why people aren't focusing on doing those sorts of things rather than, okay, let's keep putting these animals in situations where they can't cope and punish them for reacting in a way that's natural for them. Let's try and swing things the other way around. Let's help the caregivers to understand that the dogs have emotional needs and once those emotional needs are met, it makes their lives a little bit easier. There's always underlying factors that occur within our animals that drive these behaviors, that will make them want to chase. We also have, I know a lot of people in the States, um, there's like rattlesnake training and things like that. And it's like, well, I need to make sure that they're, that they're scared in these situations. There are trainers out there that have successfully taught dogs to come away from rattlesnakes. But we also, as we mentioned before, we have the lead. You know, it's not against animals' welfare to keep them on a lead. We seem to have this idea that dogs are only happy and confident if they're off lead and are allowed to run around and play. And it's wonderful to see them do that. It is. But it's not safe for all of them to. Um, you know, and as, an, as a Malamute owner, he's let off his lead very, very, very rarely insecure places where there's no livestock because I know that once he runs he's running in a straight line and for as long as he can and that will cross roads train tracks through anything and I'm not going to risk his life just to say I have a husky that recalls so we used to go on dry sledding on rigs and stuff so he would get his exercise we'd go to secure fields and he could run around I'd have him on a long line lean and quite often he would be off lead on the long line it would be on the floor but he would never be free he would never have that full freedom because I would never risk it. I also don't want to stress out any of the animals that are in the environment. We've got to look at the emotional needs of the livestock, of the wildlife. Like we're not going to compromise the welfare of one animal for another. You know, we have to be taking into account the welfare of all the animals, of all the people, of everyone that is involved. And Scott's put less discussed personality traits, the positive reinforcement trainers and how projecting their unmet needs into their dog affect their relationships. <laughs> and there's a bit of ego there, I think, with some trainers. Um, but meeting emotional needs, it's the biggest one. Um, I mean, there's a bit of a, a movement kind of going at the minute 
that is a little bit baffling to me personally because I remember an APBC conference it was the 25th anniversary conference so it would have been about 10 years nine or ten years ago now um, it was the first one I ever went to of an APBC one uh, when I was a provisional member back in the day and it was called aggression it's an emotional thing that was the title of the conference it's either eight or ten years ago now I can't remember the date and they have been trying to push for people to take into account the emotional needs of the animals to look into like Panskep's work um, and to kind of focus on finding the underlying cause and that's what we do as clinical behaviorists that's why we've got the clinical thing that's why we need the academic knowledge is that we understand the emotional needs and the driving forces behind behavior we're not just addressing the behavior we're thinking it from an ethological perspective as to why is the behavior existing in the first place what is a need that's that isn't being met um Ricky's got a Terry that's never off a lead as he has a high prey drive. Um, he's got an extending lead, but only if it's safe for him. Yeah, so like extending leads again are one of those things that kind of drive some dog trainers nuts. And they're not a be all or end all, but they have their uses. And as you said, if it's safe for you to use them, so not the side of the road, obviously, um, then they're great things, but they have to be used in the right situations, just like long lines, just like head collars and everything else. So we're not doing any harm. And Terriers in particular, you know, they're gonna go over and off and do these sorts of things so we have to look after those make sure those needs are being met but they're being net, met in a safe way in a very kind of realistic way for the animal has anyone else got any questions so far have i got people thinking a little bit more or have i just been rambling on about stuff that everyone sat there going she's talking rubbish again Hello to everyone else that's new that's watching. I keep checking down to see who else is coming on. It's nice to see so many people that have joined me on a Friday night. Um, <laughs> I'm finally like child free for an evening, so I'm like, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll go live on Facebook because, you know, don't have a life. But we want to try and start thinking about things from that ethological perspective with our dogs. Let's make sure that we're finding out the underlying cause. So when you're with a trainer that's recommending to use a, col a shock collar to stop a behavior, ask them why the behavior is there in the first place. And more often than not, the answer is dominance. And I need to write a blog or do a talk on dominance because it drives me insane when people start, start using it. No one can ever accuse you of talking rubbish. Oh, bless you, Carla. <laughs> I do think I waffle quite a lot. <laughs> Um, there are dog owners in this area that deliberately tell their dogs to go chase the grey squirrels in the woods. Oh, I guess. I just leave the wildlife out of it. Yeah. <laughs> like some dogs enjoy enjoy chasing and if they do, then you know, that's up to them. But me personally, I wanna make sure that my dogs don't chase. Um my Labrador never chased. Um she started a little bit when she was younger, then we built up a really good leave and a recall um she did pick up a chicken once um and brought it to me and i took it back to its owner and that's when she was very young um nuffle hello sweetheart um he used to like chasing squirrels and things but even if he's off lead in the woods he can run off chasing squirrels i can call him he'll come back because he's just running around chasing things because he's a he's a herding breed he likes to chase but he doesn't have that predatory chase driver because he's got other needs being met from me um spock my youngest being a herdy breed as well and quite a suppressed ish one because of all the surgery he's had to have um he wants to chase he wants to burn out their energy so we're giving him other things that he can chase and that's the thing it's like there's always other things that you can do why is the first thought always well we have to shock them it's like, well, we don't have to shock these animals. We can keep them on a lead. We can teach them other things. We cannot go and walk in the area where there's livestock or where there's that animal that they're going to chase. That is the easiest option for so many people. And for many dogs, they shouldn't be in fields with sheep. They shouldn't be in fields with cows or cattle or horses. You know, we should be avoiding these situations. Those other animals have a right to be there as well. 
Ruby, no, your comments are not coming through. Thank you for messaging me so I can see them. Oh no, does that mean there's like a whole bunch of comments that aren't coming through that I'm missing? We gutted if there is. So on this one, I haven't seen any comments from you at all, Ruby, sorry. Feel free to message me though. <laughs> so if I haven't answered anyone's comment, that means that I haven't seen it. Um, so Vic says, for, um, when I see people allowing their dogs to chase geese and duck and their younger will always say something to them. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, I tell my son off if he tries to chase pigeons. Like, I don't allow people to stress out any animals um, and dogs don't have to. Um, I mean, my dogs quite often go to nature reserves and parks where there's animals. Um, when Nuffle did his level two assistance dog thing, he had to walk through like a little farm past like sheep and goats and chickens and things. And, you know, you can teach these things to these animals and you can teach it nicely. You just build up that bond with them. We don't have to do all this nasty stuff. There's better ways out there. There's nicer ways out there. Um, Don't say, Skylar chases squirrels. Ah, he's a collie. <laughs> sometimes but i've managed to get him to come away from them when you press your zoomy on your wheelchair fantastic and you're not seeing all the comments too i know facebook's been having a few problems with the lives and things nowadays because there's been a few problems in the virtual um conference if you don't know what i'm talking about search on facebook virtual dog training conference um ruby Wellsford is running it and it's been absolutely amazing there's quite a few different ones and you'll hear a lot of things on there one of the girls um was it sean that did a lovely talk about adolescent dogs and big dogs um and how they could be trained positive too that we don't have to use prong collars with these dogs um i did a reactive dog one and a mental health one there's some wonderful advice so if you're watching this and you have used shot collars or you're thinking about doing it then please Come and join the Force Free Trainers. Just have a chat to some of us. Join our groups. Message me privately if you want to, or we can arrange a, a session and I can give you all the bits of advice that you can do. Um, I would much rather see an animal being trained in a Force Free way rather than being subjected to these devices because they're just not necessary. You know, I'm not going to argue about whether they work or if they don't work. They're not needed. They are not necessary. There isn't a single situation that I can think of where we're going to need these devices in order to save the dog's life because there's other things that we can do um nothing did super well when we did martin Mir. he did he did really well um this is a friend of mine that came to martin me with me and nuffle and he was just like plodding along at our side with like birds and things moving around um some of the swans in particular quite quite um they found it intriguing when these systems start coming to the park because they tend to follow them which was great for some of the wildlife photographers because the animals will come over, the birds would be like, there's a dog there, what's it doing? And Nuff will just sit there chilling out and pay no attention to them. So the photographer's got some great shots. Um, but I'll give you a second to see if anyone else has any more comments. And I'm just going to have a jump on my phone and see if I can have a look on both of the groups to see if there's any comments that I have missed. Because I'd hate to... Um, to have some comments that I've missed. Because I like to make sure that I, that I reply to everyone. You know, even if you don't agree with anything that I'm saying, I'm always happy for people to challenge my point of view. If you have evidence out there that it goes against what I'm saying and it proves it, then I am open to it. That's the whole point of science. Um, Don would love to see photos of Nuffle at Martin Mir. There might be some on Facebook. There's definitely a couple of pictures of him sat with the swans. Um, I think has Spock been... I'm not sure if Spock's been up to Martin Mir yet. Um, take Skylar up there. Uh, they're really wheelchair friendly. Oh yeah, the snake wanted to eat him. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so they had like a reptile person there and I took Nuffle into the room. And this giant, it was either, a, I think it was a boa constrictor. It just, it, it smelled that there was a dog in the area. And it started to like move, like constrict against one of the children. <laughs> so they had to put the snake away because it was getting a little bit too, um, 
excited with the fact that there was life prey um, in the area, which was a little bit. I was like, so me and Nuffa were asked to leave the um, the reptile um, place <laughs> for that reason. I didn't take him into um, where the birds of prey were for the same reason. I didn't want to stress them out. Um, I didn't worry too much about the the reptiles at the time um, because the snakes just saw him as prey. And there's really anything that would have felt more predator-wise. Um, but yeah, like come and have a talk to us. Anyone that likes this video and you want to share it with people, feel free. I have no issue doing that. I'm happy to spot, talk to anyone about these things because we need to open these conversations. We need to have these discussions. We need to talk to other people. I mean, if you are an advocate for the use of shock collars and want to do a live with me, I am more than happy for you to come and do a live with me. And we can sit and we can debate like adults and professionals about the pros and cons. And we can sit there and talk through it and see if we can come to some agreement. See if you can convince me. I mean, I know I can convince myself because one of the exercises that we had to do at Southampton when I did my master's was you had to write ethical art. It was part of the ethics module. You had to write arguments for and against shock collars. And I can write a better argument for the use of these devices than I can against it on paper. Um, so I know all the pros to using them. I'm not going to argue that. But I am going to let people know that there are better ways out there. Because I'm like, yes, they work. Yes, they do these things. But we don't have to. And we shouldn't be putting clients in a position where they feel the need to. Um, Carlos put, thank you so much for this. I'd not thought of the effects of shock collars in humans before. You've also explained really well to why they are so damaging to dogs. Thank you so much, Carla. And it's the human side of things that I really wanted to to bring to light because I I rarely see the argument being put forward when people are discussing shock collars. It's so like you're in a position of authority and we have to be aware of that. You know, anything we ask our clients to do and anything they ask their clients to do, they're seen as that voice of authority and that's automatically going to have an effect on the psyche of that individual where they're going to agree to things that they may not necessarily agree to because the personal authority has said it. You know, most of us have been in a situation with it either being teachers or bosses or doctors, any situation where someone you see as being a higher authority than you has asked you to do something or has asked you to not say something. So anything that goes against what you kind of believe and you kind of go with because they're the voice of authority. Like we know that's a thing that happens. We also know that if there's groups of people are doing the same thing, we kind of get that condition that, well, everyone's doing it, so it's kind of okay. We also have that psychological structure where, have you seen the, there was a study and there's a few programs that have demonstrated it where someone's asked a really simple question like what's plus two, two plus two? And someone's like, ah, and they write down four on their piece of paper and then everyone else in the room puts six and they then question their four, not based on their own knowledge, but they then start to feel belittled by their own knowledge, they start to doubt their own knowledge and go, oh, maybe I am wrong. And it is six. And then when asked, everyone else in the room says six, they then say six. Despite having four written down on their paper, they say six and I'll just comply with the group. So we have to be very aware of the psychological effects on the people when we're in these situations and that kind of group mentality because some people will go along with it because the group is going along with it and they're not thinking as an individual, they're thinking as a group. And for anyone that's ever seen riots, anyone that works in security, you'll understand that mob mentality where a person is smart, they have full autonomy, they have control. When you have a group mentality, people change and they will mirror the people next to them. And sometimes they will go against what they do. So we need to be very aware of these principles when we're dealing with these devices, which is, again, one of those reasons why I would never use them. I would never want to be the, that authority figure that suggests, is, suggests to someone that they need to shock their dog. It's hard enough for me as a behaviorist when we have to counsel people through behavioral euthanasia. But at least I know that what I'm doing then is, is a welfare thing. It is in the best interests of the animal at that time in that situation. And that's easier for me to deal with. I could never put them in a situation where the welfare was increased and they were doing more harm than good. So I've been rambling for about an hour now. So I should probably shut up. Um, Danny has some great knowledge. Oh, thank you. 
I don't take compliments well. I'm just going to shrink away. And, um, I just have a lot of, I have different knowledge and a depth of knowledge that's a bit weird, but I can join some groups of things together. Um, it's a bit of a, that's what I'm finding. That's kind of like my skill in this industry is I have a little bit of knowledge of a lot of different things to a decent level. So when people explain something, I can kind of draw links and parallels together and kind of go, oh, you two should talk to each other because you'll, you'll work this bit out. Um, so thank you for joining me, those of you that have. I will let you all go and have a wonderful Friday evening, have an even better weekend. And feel free to share the video once it's recorded and uploaded. Um, be aware of the trolls because they will come. Because uh, once you start talking shock colours, there's always people that are going to be out to get you that will take clips of the video and take words out of context and all the rest of it. And, you know, if that's what they feel the need to do, then they can do. And it just kind of, for me, anyone that feels the need to do that, it kind of plays into what I mentioned earlier about the personality traits and the psychology of the people that use these devices, if that's how they approach people that have a different opinion to themselves. Um, so I will leave that that theory with everyone. So I hope you have a wonderful evening. I hope I've, I've helped you learn a little bit of something new or at least think a little bit differently. So when you're speaking to people at these devices, you have another thought to go down that might make them think a little bit more, especially if we can get any of these trainers to start thinking about the effect they're having on the people. Like if they don't care about the welfare of the dog, can they care about the welfare of the fellow humans? Um, Oh, thank you, Vic. That's so nice to say. Uh, you're very welcome, Jean. Um, and thank you for being in my mentorship thing as well. It's lovely to have you. Um, love to you too, Dawn. <laughs> Spock Nuffle. I'm assuming that's Difa. Autocorrect always likes to change things. Um, love to Skylar as well. Love to everyone. And I will leave you for the evening. Thank you very much. Bye.